Hello, dear friends of the DLD. Hope everyone is doing well and staying healthy. I'm sorry to disappoint. Steffi Cherny is just coming back from a long trip and she just landed with a bit of delay. So she is watching though. So hi, Steffi. She's watching from her phone. Um, we are happy to be back once again with an exciting and thought provoking DLD sync session. Today, we're going to speak about making cities smarter and more sustainable. And we have one of the top experts in the field to tell you about it. Francesca Bria, president of the Italian National Innovation Fund and a member of the new European Bauhaus Initiative, which was started by a good friend of the DLD, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the EU Commission. We will hear from Francesca in conversation with Lauren Keel, the general manager for Bloomberg Green, a multi-platform editorial brand by Bloomberg Media, which is focused on climate change news analysis and solutions. But before we start, let, let me briefly tell you about our big upcoming event in May that we as DLD are very excited about. As some of you might already know, we are holding finally our flagship DLD Munich conference is in just a few weeks from May 20th to the 22nd. Um, this will be our biggest event of the year with many exciting speakers analyzing the most relevant topics in technology, business, arts and society. You can find more on our website and find out how you can apply your, for tickets. We're really happy to bring our community and so many top speakers back together for this event after so many months of seeing each other mostly on, online. As, and I feel, and we all do, that this DLD Sync session we're about to watch will be a great warm up for our conference in May because it addresses such an important topic, the future of cities. Cities have played a more important role in shaping the world than empires, Michael Bloomberg once observed. Michael Bloomberg, of course, is not just the founder of Bloomberg Media, but also was the mayor of New York City for 11 years. He said this because for most of history, people lived in towns and villages. Even in 1950, only New York and Tokyo had a population of over 10 million. Now, more than half of the world's population live in urban areas, and the United Nations expect Delhi in India to become the biggest city in the world by 2030, with almost 40 million wow, people living in this one mega city alone. 40 million people, imagine. That's half the population of Germany, and it shows how important cities have become. They are home to many of us. They are economic centers and prov provide many opportunities. But they also bring noise and pollution and many other challenges to sustainability. And the COVID pandemic has shown how vulnerable and imperfect cities can be in a time of crisis. But the good news is that there are also many solutions to these problems. Our experts today, Francesca and Lauren, will share their insights and explain how we can shape cities for a smarter, greener, more livable future. Before we start the session, however, um, we would like to thank our partner, She's Mercedes, for their support with our DLD Sync series. For those of you who might not be familiar, She's Mercedes is a platform dedicated to inspiring, connecting, and empowering women, highlighting their unique success and creating a dialogue that transcends culture, industries, and experiences. Please have a look at the short clip of some of the wonderful collaborations we've done together in the past. And now I would like to invite Francesca and Lauren on our virtual stage to give us their female perspective when it comes to shaping the future of cities. Dear Francesca, dear Lauren. Hello. Hi. Hello. Let us start by your definition of the city of the 21st century. 
how about I start first and then Francesca, I'll, I'll toss that question to you and so many more that I have for you as well. Um, but as I think about the, the city of the 21st century, I think a lot about circularity and what it means for cities to become more circular. So we're how, how we're moving from a, a linear economy where we're, we're taking new things, we're creating new things, and then we're wasting them to moving into a world where there, there's more reuse, um, there's more refinement, there's more recycling and rebuilding and renewing. Um, that's everything from buildings and infrastructure to how we think about mobility in cities, uh, how we think about recycling and waste management to sharing and leasing services and, and so many things I know Francesca and I are going to get into today. So Francesca, what about you? What do you think are, are the big defining factors of the, the 21st century city? I'm afraid I will, I will be very aligned to your um, definition and uh, uh, I also have a very positive, let's say, view of what cities can uh, be in the future. And I think today, more than ever, uh, because of the multiple crises we are living in, uh, cities can be seen as a laboratory for a sustainable and democratic future, exactly. And I think for me, the exciting uh, thing about cities is, first of all, to combine the ecological and green transition towards circularity that you uh, described with the possibility of democratic digitization, which really means to try to shift uh, the power back to the people and try to put at the very center of what we mean uh, by digital, which is not actually the smart city, uh, let's say, definition of a big tech technology first city, but actually a people first city uh, where uh, we can really experiment radically democratic new models for, uh, let's say, for example, uh, democratic data ownership, uh, but also really creating public value and uh, impact, which can be environmental impact and positive social impact um, by mobilizing the collective intelligence of people and by putting technology, artificial intelligence, connectivity and data at the service of society. And I think this is a, a big, big challenge. And possibly, yes, I also think that um, proximity is key to democratic experimentation. And in this moment, for example, in Europe, the post-pandemic times, uh, of course, we are uh, having a lot of struggles when it comes to economic uncertainty, but we need to really shift uh, a big, big time. So we need radically new uh, models and uh, forward-looking projects that need to be concrete. So cannot just be big, big investment and smart regulation, but they also need to make an impact for everyday life of citizens. And I think that's where cities can make the difference. I want to delve into all of those great topics that you just brought up. And, and I want to start with the smart cities one, um, especially because I know that you were the chief technology officer for the city of Barcelona. So given that hat and get, given everything that you've done since, what, how would you define a smart city? What is that, what word does that, you know, what does that term mean to you? I think it can be such a buzzword or buzz phrase, but how would you actually define a smart city? Yeah, I would uh, move away from technological solutionism. I think this is the biggest problems of the smart city uh, discourse that it used to be a really a technology uh, invented terminology. So I remember it, you know, big tech firms uh, promoting smart cities. And we have an idea of a smart city that starts with technology. So we start talking about blockchain, connectivity, data, AI, before thinking about what kind of real environmental and social issues we want to target. So I think we have to move away and forget about technological solutionism and starts with the circular economy, with um, new sustainable and connected mobility, uh, the fight against climate change, new type of democratic participation. And then we can say, how can we govern technology in a democratic way, artificial intelligence and data, and putting all this power, this capacity of the new technological infrastructures at the service of tackling the real environmental um, and social issues that cities are facing, but also devolving, let's say, power back to the people. 
And in Barcelona, we've been doing a lot of experiments around, um, for example, democratic participation. We scaled like large scale, let's say democratic experiments where we arrived to involve 400,000 citizens in the decision making process of the city and 70% of the proposals that became the action plan of the city of Barcelona came directly from citizens. And this was a hybrid model of participatory democracy, both offline, so in the neighborhood, neighborhood by neighborhood, engaging with citizens and stakeholders, and then online by creating a platform for democratic participation that now became the de facto European platform, let's say the European alternative to Facebook, which is built with open source software, um, ethical and secure use of data, and it's owned by the citizens themselves. And I think this also uh, brings us to the question of how, um, you know, we can combine large scale, you know, forward looking projects about urban planning. For example, you talked about the circular economy, but I think one of the greatest challenges in cities is, uh, for example, mobility, reshaping mobility, redefining public space, move, move in, in a place where there will be no cars in the city center. We move in a kind of shared sustainable electric mobility. We have a lot of research on hydrogen, on connectivity, so 5G and AI that enable a new connected um, mobility mobility uh, process and cities that are pioneering the 15 minutes models, no, not this kind of urban planning where it's all centered on citizens having access to basic uh, services um, in within 15 minutes. So really reshaping a public space. And I think we cannot do this kind of real ra radical transformation if we do not engage uh, strongly citizens. So I don't know what, what do you think, Lauren, about this combination uh, with the ecological transition, digitization, how do we make it democratic? How do we really start from communities, from citizens and devolving power back to the citizens, but also engaging them in this kind of large scale transformations? Because otherwise, I'm afraid we don't implement the changes we want to see. You brought up a topic that I was going to raise too about the 15 minute city or, or even I've heard the 10 minute city, the one minute city of everything being on, on your own street, um, which is really just this idea that everything that you would need to be able to access to live a normal life should be within 15 minute walk from you or 10 or one or what, whatever we're defining it as. So the pharmacy that you need, the grocery store that you need, the, you know, the doctor that you need, the office that you go to, all of the, all of those things. And it's a model of rethinking the way that we're we're interacting with cities. I don't think many places that's a, that's a possibility um, right now, um, but it's definitely something as if we want to think about what a more circular city would look like or what a more sustainable city would look like, a world where that level of transportation that you need to get around the city would change, you know, the circularity of the city would change. So I think that that is an ideal model where we'd be able to bring those things closer. Um, and it's it's a challenge, as, as um, Melissa was saying at the very beginning, mm -hmm. there's a huge difference between the, the structure that we have in New York City, where I'm right now, versus the structure that you have in Barcelona, versus the structure in Delhi that she mentioned. Um, and, you know, cities across the globe in these different regions are, are dealing with that so very differently. And, and I would love your thoughts on that, Francesca. Just how are you seeing those those level of challenges differ between, you know, when we talk about if we wanted to put those models in place in a European city versus in a, a New York or a Los Angeles or a Mexico city versus a, a Delhi or, you know, any of these different wildly different geographies. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I really liked when I was working uh, in Barcelona as chief technology officer, I was also coordinating a network of global cities on innovation, on sustainable and democratic innovation. And for me, it's very fascinating to see how cities are very strong in global diplomacy, but also in really shaping and creating networks where you're able to learn uh, from what other cities are doing, even if you have very different uh, um, situation, a very different type of city, a very different geography, economics, a very different region, also very different needs. But I think we have 
so many common problems and also more more and more solutions and services and really this mindset you know this change in mindset that is needed which is common to uh, many cities uh, so for example um, the kind of 15 minute city uh, model now is very um, popular throughout Europe so for, for example Barcelona had what we call the uh, super blocks the super areas uh, which is a model that has been um, copied I think replicated uh, um, in many places where you basically create this kind of soup blocks and you reshape the entire mobility of the city we recuperate the 60 percent of public space by removing cars from the city centers and creating um, new um, green spaces new spaces for pedestrians new spaces for electric mobility new spaces for um, also transit to link better the public transportation with the uh, private transportation systems so really rethinking how we do that uh, but also engaging with architects urbanists designers students businesses local businesses uh, taxi drivers, for example, uh, many different uh, interested parties in order to reshape this kind of mobility and urban planning, because otherwise you can't get to this 15 minutes model. And then I think it's never kind of a 15 or a 10 or a 20, but it's really about how we uh, work on this reshaping um, our the way we do urban planning reshaping mobility redefining the use of housing for example affordable housing um the the mix between what is uh living what is working and what is business so how we re-give re um, a balance to this kind of activities and and but also how we create less inequalities and i think this is a topic which um is very big for all cities um it's how do we give access to this good and sustainable and basic services to people that are in a more vulnerable situation and we saw it in the pandemic even more that you know uh, it's it's really hard for people to get access to public health care or sanitation and all these different uh, services so we need to also shape this kind of um future cities thinking about the most vulnerable people don't leaving anyone behind which is also the new urban agenda for the un and i think there of course you plan very different if you are in delhi if you are in south america if you are in new york or if you are in europe but at the end the basic infrastructure you need this kind of um, methodology for planning also how do you build skills and capacity in cities how do you um you know inject new resources i think lauren this is a big topic for me because we always say cities are at the center of um you know experimenting all these new systems that we need um shifting and you know renewable energy electric mobility circularity um you know doing everything local so it's like turning you know the global economy into something very different but sometimes and many times cities lack financial resources they lack also regulatory uh power and they lack human uh skills and capital and so and so like collaborating you know creating this network of cities that are experimenting projects but also sharing uh services and learning from each other is absolutely key because of the lack of resources so i think uh, this element mm -hmm. we need to understand that cities are very different so we're not going to have one solutions that fit all i think this is a very bad approach but i think this learning i mean this working together is super powerful and that's where for example uh, you, i mean c40 networks networks of cities that are um, you know fighting climate change that are uh, like the cities coalition for digital rights of the new the un all these coalitions are really really powerful and I think you you brought up a really important point about the the interconnectivity of trying to deal with all these challenges across cities. This is not something that just the city government makes a decision or puts a policy in place and then it's solved. There's you know quite a lot that has to be done from the private sector in terms of what solutions they're able to provide, the financing, which I know is something that you're focused on now as well, and how yeah. that comes to life, getting the people on board with it. Um, and so the examples that you were giving about mobility in cities, I think, is a great one if we if we look at things like like 
the low or no emission zones that are happening in cities. Um, London, I think, is a great example of, of putting that into place. Can be a great way to improve the air quality, to get some of those cars off the road, but then there needs to be changes in maybe people's working habits and abilities for people to work remotely during those hours, or there needs to be more public transportation, or there needs to be that um, private sector, you know, electric vehicle supply that we're able to, to fill in for all of those pieces. So I'm curious how you're thinking about that, especially around that financing piece, like how do we motivate all of those different groups to work together and incentivize those those bigger policies and make sure that we don't just put the policies in place, but actually there's the, you know, the solutions to back it up, that the, the people are on board and the companies are on board to actually make them come to life. Yeah, this is the kind of system thinking that you need. I think we, in financing is really, really important that you have a symbiotic relationship between public and private so that you don't only, you know, wait for public investment or you just do a kind of privatized, fully privatized project, but that there is this combination of public investment that can leverage uh, private investment and, and then um, that we all kind of align with the impact that we want to create giving back um, to, to, to people, giving back to, to citizens, in fact, in quality of life, in quality of services that we provide, but also in the sustainability of the services. I think that one topic for me that was very big with the smart cities, for example, is that you start testing and prototyping and you have all these kind of sandboxes and experimentation, which is really exciting because we are moving into, you know, we need to um, uh, test new type of AI driven services, new type of connectivity, uh, new infrastructures. But at the same time, we don't only want to test something and then, you know, whatever, leave it, but we want to create solutions that are sustainable in time and that can scale and can become real, you know, services that are accessible and affordable for people. And I think this, to do this jump, to do this scaling up and to do this sustainability part, I think that's where we need um, much more involvement of the private sector. Uh, for example, I mean, in Europe, this uh, combination between the European level of policy and investment and then national and city scale is really important to align this different level of government, because somehow in this experimentation that you do, you can test the uh, legal, the regulatory new business model, new economic model, which are about the circular economy, by the way. So how do we make that work? And then the social impact. So you have all these different dimensions that can be combined. And um, and I think um, one part that is very fascinating, because of course, then you can involve also the startups. For example, now I run the uh, Italian National Innovation Fund, which is a five billion uh, fund to foster the innovative economy, so startups and their capacity to innovate and to come up with all these uh, solutions. We mostly is actually on new energy, uh, sustainable energy, uh, the green transition, uh, new forms of materials, uh, how to decarbonize, how to move to a built environment that consume, I mean, that basically gets to net zero, but actually is um, CO2 um, negative not only net zero but we have to absorb co2 as we know so all these new solutions will come up uh by the innovators you know the, the startups the new companies but then you need to align also the big infrastructure providers so the big companies for example when it comes to mobility you will have the uh, mobility operators the public transportation systems and the startups and how you create incentives when you do new regulation so new regulation for example about um, shared mobility uh, how can you do it in a way that you don't stifle innovation, but we need to have smart regulation, aligning all these actors and then creating public value and positive social and environmental impact. For me, this is the key. And sometimes maybe even national level politicians and European politicians don't see enough the benefit of cities into being total pioneers and experimenting new form of regulations with concrete projects, concrete standards, and the type of financing, financing uh, mechanisms, but also new economic models that become what you need to scale. So for example, for the EU Green Deal, 
to do it um, not only, as you say, top-down regulation and, you know, the new kind of financial taxonomy, the new big investment schemes, big, big companies. That's one part. But I think if you don't get, uh, if you don't mobilize the power of cities that develop services in proximities with citizens and all these different innovative capacity and then bring it back to the national and European and possibly global scale, because that's also what cities do. I think you really struggle to uh, make sure that all these changes that we talk about, they become the key infrastructures for the future. I mean, the key building blocks on top of which we're building this actually sustainable, democratic and green uh, future. So how do you I think we change that, Francesca? Yeah. How do you think we change that? Because I think you're bringing up a really interesting point about cities are this incredible laboratory, but if the national government or the global world is not looking at these cities with, from that lens, then that is a big problem for actually scaling those solutions. So how do you think that we change that? Well, we change that. So for example, as, as I was talking about C40, uh, the power of mayors, uh, the, I, I think for me is the power of the ex experimentation that really has a story, that really has managed to to have an impact on the life of citizens and have this kind of powerful stories. Uh, I think that's how cities uh, are, you know, very, very strong. Um, I think, for example, in, in Europe as well, when it comes to the green transition, all the examples that I can think of, decarbonization, um, you know, uh, future mobility, sustainable mobility, new uh, public planning, um, you know, new energy, even new energy models are experimented in cities first. And I can think of, you know, for example, Helsinki has this incredible plan uh, to transform uh, the city to uh, net zero by uh, 2035. And it's really like they have a lot of implementations already done and 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 many inspiring inspiring uh projects um when i think about um democratic participation cities are the place where this is happening and i think as we know uh national governments many times struggle with this um relationship between citizens and public institution getting back trust so i think trust is a really important part where cities because they are closer to the citizens they just you know all the time kind of experiment new ways for deliberation listening uh, engaging interacting with citizens they are there they're already doing uh deliberative democracy in a new way and in a new form using digital tools and so on so I think it's it's all about making this action much more visible and more connected and then channel resources for cities. Because as we are saying, if you do not have the right type of investments, if you don't have the right type of resources, this is not going to happen. And I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Next Generation EU, which is this big investment scheme, uh, post-pandemic investment scheme of around three uh, trillion um, uh, euros. Uh, which is shared by all European countries. We have big ambitions when it comes to digitization and, um, and, sustain and sustainability, so the Green Deal and the Green Transition. But a lot of these things, when you look at them, how they have to be implemented, how they have to become real, there is cities. Cities and local administrations, but as you're saying, also this kind of systemic approach involving the public, the private sector, the startups, the, the social enterprises, the innovators, the citizens themselves. But it will have to really strengthen the capacity of cities to act, of cities to implement. And and um, so, so I think that, that's basically how we change it, creating this continuous link uh, that is not just some kind of cities experiments, but that these, these are um, the projects that work and that will create this shift at a, at a much uh, global uh, level. I love before how when I asked you about, you know, being the chief technology officer, what you're thinking about a smart city that you immediately went to talk about people. You didn't talk about the technologies that you'd put into place or, you know, the, the exciting things you were doing there. You immediately talked about how you were taking into account the impact of the people in the city and their opinions and how we get them on board with this. So I would love to hear more about that, too, as we think about, you know, what it means to be a more livable city from the sustainability and this and the smart and technology city landscape. Like, 
how did you get to that point where you you knew that people were the ones to really you know bring along on this journey with you? Um, do you feel like other cities have gotten that that picture as well? Um, how do you harness that power of, of the people who live in the cities? Yeah, well, when I when I went to work uh, in Barcelona, I, I was based in London before, and uh, the the mayor of uh, Barcelona, Ada Colau, she uh, she called me up because she saw my work on uh, democratic uh, digital cities, and she told me, "Look, I want to change completely the idea of the smart city, and I want you to be able to explain the smart city to my mother and my grandmother, to tell them that this is not all about technology, and to explain them how." it's going to solve some of the problems they experience in their life. And, and I was like, wow, this is a great challenge because in fact, I thought that we spent far too much time talking about the exciting new tech and but also really doing a technology experiment starting from the technology. I had so many, you know, um, tech firms that come to you and gives you know, ex explain you this beautiful new IoT system or this new beautiful new technology platform or service. But when you ask them, but okay, what problem is it really solving? What is it doing to transform the city? What is it doing to the to the life of the city? They actually don't know. So it's a technology that is searching for a problem. So you need to reverse that kind of um, approach and start from understanding the real uh, problems and how this uh, affects the life of citizens, have a participatory process in place to make them you know, part of the of the process, but also the of the policy making process of the solution, and of possibly also uh, making them very active in running the service of being part, for example, of energy community. Now, energy community is a very big topic because citizens um, and communities can actually produce um, renewable energy. They can produce, you know, they can um, produce energy with uh, solar power. Uh, and then through via a distributed electric grid, they can also, you know, control a bit better how they consume energy. I mean, now with energy prices skyrocketing and people are really, energy poverty is again a very big uh, topic and people struggle to pay uh, the bill at the end of the month. And so you need to, um, you know, engage people in these new solutions. So with technology, you really have to, regain this trust and for me i mean democratizing data democratizing artificial intelligence but also really involving people is the essence of digitization because otherwise we will end all this we will end up, end up with this debate about how concentration of power in the digital economy the big tech which is you know running the world and also surveillance which is not something that people are comfortable with um in europe there's a very big um debate but also in the us of course you have the antitrust debate but also the surveillance topic and people feel you know they are uh being controlled and you know the, the kind of algorithms become starts making decisions without you knowing what's happening to your data without you knowing who's accessing the data for what purpose on what terms so in barcelona for example we were speaking about a new deal like a new deal on data, a new deal in the digital society, where this kind of democracy, but also the ethical approach, the, the I mean, the privacy, ethics, security by design, but also really democratizing this ownership of data and infrastructures become a key issue. And in cities, we can radically experiment new models for doing that. And also putting this technology, this power of technology of platforms with, the, with these new democratic governance systems at the service of the green transition, because I think that's what we need to do at the service of the circularity, Lauren, that you were talking at the beginning. So digital is not going to solve it by itself. It has to be put at the service of a project. And I think this project is the green uh, deal, is the green transition, is the circularity, is radically shifting our way of living, but doing that, um, you know, with, with, with an idea of how we want to live in the future. So if you start from technology, you never get to discuss how we want to live in the future. And so for me, it is obvious that the smart city is about shaping the future city together with people and, and, that, that, and then leveraging the power of technology and collective intelligence to do that.
so it's it's just about reframing a little bit the discourse because otherwise yes we end up in this technology solutionism and we continue to make apps that you know are not really solving the big the big things i think there's a lot of parallels there with making greener cities to with what you're saying about smart cities with really just reframing how people are thinking about this reframing the time frames which they're thinking about things i know one of the things people are talking about a lot right now is just the cost of living in cities is incredibly high in many places um and i'm, I'm sure the same thing is true for smart cities it's definitely true for for greener and sustainability cities people think oh that must cost more it's going to cost us more in the short term it's going to be more difficult it's going to be more economically challenging and they, we Who's need to reframe to who's yeah. going to pay for it exactly i'm going to pay for it and i'm already paying you know so much to live here and commute here and all those things and so there's a lot of reframing there that also needs to be done for people um, just like you were saying in terms of the time horizons that they're thinking about the educating them on on you know there's a lot of places where it actually won't cost more or will save more or how we think about all of that that integrates um, because i think that, that can be one of the big challenges as we start to to think about how we make that transition and uh, what would you say are some of the most exciting experiments when it comes to the green cities that you are seeing around also in the diversity of the of the situation in in the US or in Europe or in Asia? I think there's some really interesting um as we think about circularity in cities, the, the things that I'm most excited about following um, are around how we transition to to smarter buildings. And I think that oftentimes when people think about buildings, they think, oh, that must mean we need to build brand new, you know, LEED certified green buildings. And that is part of it. But a lot of it is also retrofitting and how we're thinking about how we're going back to the pre-existing buildings that we do have there, especially in Europe. I know you have you guys have a wide array of buildings that have been around for hundreds of years that need to be retrofitted. And that's a smarter approach rather than rebuilding and starting over from scratch. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, getting people to to think about the, the impacts that we can have as we build, bring some of those more sustainable technologies around renewable energy, for example, into those buildings. Um, and that's something where we can have just a massive impact in, in cities across the world. Uh, we've touched a bunch on mobility, which I think is also a really exciting opportunity for cities as we think about. And I, I think the last two years really shown us how we can get cars off the roads or how we rethink the, the traffic patterns, the commuting patterns that our cities have and the impacts that those things can have. Um, and then really thinking about, you know, how we do more in that that sharing and leasing space. There's um, there had been such a big push, which I think, again, overlaps with smart cities um, around, you know, shared services like the the Ubers and Lyfts and the transit, you know, and the the scooters that we share and all of those things that we can share. And I think there had been a, a slight move away from some of that over the last couple of years that's that's ready to come back. And how do we think about what that that sharing economy looks like for cities in a way that's more sustainable. Um, what about you? Up. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, no, I was thinking about the built environment that um, one trend I see uh, that's really interesting for me is the bio-based materials. So how mm. we go back into using, um, you know, wood uh, into using um, new like materials that is totally sustainable that is bio-based and it's uh, you know moving away from concrete which obviously consumes co2 and the uh, construction industry consumes uh, the most co2 emissions of all and so uh, I, I was thinking when you were talking that um, we see this trend in city timber timber construction very much and um, exploring um, this material that also links back to uh, circularity and uh, and cities becoming a bit of a laboratory for this um, circularity that starts from rethinking um, how yeah how we can change the construction industry and then there is also the question of logistics and the question of how we move things around and transportation of course and um and about the sharing economy some work that is really exciting uh, that i see happening now combining i think we need to combine much more this um sustainability trends this green cities and sustainable city with with the digitization somehow they are still kept a bit uh, separate um also in the city administrations sometimes the people that are doing the climate action plans or the sustainability plans or that are doing urban development they are 
very separated from the people thinking about technology, while I think more and more when we see at what needs to happen, but also how much we need data in order to make informed, informed decisions, in order to, to know what's happening, in, or, in order to control and know how we consume, what we consume, the impact of the policy we put in place. So this kind of data for me is a new meta utility that is absolutely critical to everything that we do, also to do new forms of urban planning to yeah, exactly decide and, and, and see what happens. So we need to bring these things um, together. And in the sharing economy, for example, the impact of algorithms is now, you know, this kind of algorithmic regulation. It's something very important. Uh, I remember being part of this coalition of cities that came together to see how to regulate, for example, Airbnb and Uber. And then one of the questions, because cities were used to only regulate, for example, um, how you pay the local tax or regulate regulate on the basis of, um, you know, transport regulation or um, Airbnb, the number of days that you can rent an apartment in the city center or where you can do it, where you can't do it. But then it starts to become really, really important to have access to data and to see and to have the kind of accountability and transparency of algorithms because it was clear that if you don't know what's happening, if you don't know how that's affecting the price of land, how that's affecting the price of um, housing, how that's affecting, you know, your whole environment, you can't regulate it well. So these cities came together and they started to also say, OK, how we can also share the data. And, and I'm working now with the city of Hamburg in a very, very exciting project, which is about a new sharing between public and private so that um but but by devolving also control to the user to the citizens so so you have a kind of public and private uh, sharing in mobility i think this is very important how do we share the public data the private data and then we have a data trust model where um you know it's very transparent who can access this kind of data for what purpose and what happens you know when um yeah, you regulate based on the kind of information that is transparent to everybody. And, and so you could, you know, have a much better regulation if you are transparent about the algorithm and you can have a better impact, for example, on the working environment of gig workers or platform workers, because, you know, today uh, the boss is your algorithm and you get also your points and you get your rewards and you get your uh, salary based on what the algorithm says and you can have discrimination of all kinds. So I think introducing this, um, you know, new experimentation and new forms of uh, democratically a control shared data for the benefit of all the stakeholders. I think it's a new frontier that will also get us to do much more uh, of the kind of projects you were talking about. I think that's another great place where, where technology and, and smarter cities and greener cities really overlap is just the, in that access to data and the need for that access to data. I think there's been in, in cities in general and especially in the sustainability space, there's been a, a lack of access to data or, you know, a, a lack of ability to interpret data, which I think has made massive shifts in the last couple of years. Um, we're seeing so much, so many more disclosure rules um, around ESG data and, you know, I think just giving that accessibility uh, to what you were saying about before about getting people involved and making them be part of the decision making, you know, allowing that data to be um, at their fingertips and also to make it interpretable, which is a big piece. You can give them data, but if they don't know how to use it or what it means, then it's no, it's no good for people. Um, and really giving people a better understanding of, you know, the pollution levels in their cities, for example, what the air quality is like in your city, those type of things that people usually may not have access to or may not understand will we'll have a radical impact on their decision making as they start to think about, you know, where they want to live in the city or how they might use tra their transportation systems. When you feel like you're part of that challenge or you're part of that solution, um, that data can be a really big, big piece of, of making that transition. Um, so how do you think we we really help people to feel like they have access to the data that they need and that they, they have 
a bit more of empowerment in, in selecting these challenges. I think a lot of times we talk about, as we talk about things like net zero, which feel like a massive, high level, global challenge, we're dealing with net zero, like companies make net zero commitments, countries make net zero commitments, like the EU makes a net zero commitment. I think that can feel overwhelming for people sometimes. They're like, well, what do I do as just one person living in New York City that's actually gonna make any difference? Can I do anything? You know, how do we get people past that almost paralysis where this doesn't feel like it's just a global problem. It's something that we all have a say yeah, in yeah, and yeah. an ability no, to deal yeah. with. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, I think, um, again, I think cities can do a lot there because um, I think we are tackling not so much individual problems, but collective problems. And then obviously the individual behavior is a great uh driver and it will be needed so, so so everybody should feel they have a way and a space to contribute and to change um, the way they do things but I think uh, we need an engagement that's much more political in a sense we need political decisions to happen at all possible levels and then we need to as you said also before to show that I mean who is that is just this transition that you know we we take into account the different level of, um, you know, of needs and vulnerability that different communities have. And also we take that into account in the kind of incentives we put in place, either being uh, financial incentives or, um, you know, taxation schemes that should be more progressive or access to public services that would help people to transition in a way that's more fair and just. And also, obviously, as we said, before, I mean, now people are very um, worried about the cost of living, but also about inflation and their salaries. And so we need all kinds of policies in place to make sure that, um, you know, they, that this transformation will also create very good jobs. And these jobs are, um, you know, staying in places because people feel that, um, you know, for example, automation or the shift towards green transition can kill entire part of industries and can automate jobs and move jobs away from where they are. So I think I think that's why also we need to work at different levels. For example, for me, it's clear that when we need um, global taxation schemes, we need to work at a European or global level and we need new forms of industrial policies that are incentivizing this kind of um, energy transition and the decarbonization and, um, you know, the shift uh, towards the circular economy, but that all of these as an impact in the local place. And that's where cities can make a difference. And that's where, for example, if we have a waste management uh, system that's circular, and then people know how they can contribute to that, and can, they, they know how they can, they have to, you know, um, do this um sustainable and circular waste uh, uh, waste management, then, you know, you it will work. <laughs> if people don't know how to contribute it, how to do it, how to, you know, separate plastic, how to, um, you know, to, uh, yeah, start using uh, better transportation systems, how to change, for example, the you said before, like smart working, you know, smart working will need a part which is, you know, people getting involved and try to work from uh, remote and and also there, you know, you will need a lot of policies, for example, for women and making sure that are not the women that are paying the cost and stay at home and staying at home with kids and in spaces that are not designed for working. But having said that, I think you also need the institutional framework to have smart uh, agreements that enable people to keep doing their jobs and, uh, you know, have uh, good salaries and so on. So it will be a transformation that's actual pretty complex, you need to have um, all the pieces together, but then at the end, uh, the participation, I think, and coming back to participation is key because you could implement all these programs in a kind of, um, let's say, um, non-democratic way. I mean, you could be driving it and say, okay, this is a kind of authoritarian shift. Yes. I mean, we saw a lot of, a, a lot of these also on kind of digitization, for example, um, authoritarian, let's say, models coming from China, which can be effective, you know, on a long term, but definitely that's not what people are expecting in in here. For example, in Europe, many, many uh, solutions that 
you know, don't engage people, don't respect their fundamental rights, uh, don't uh, give them access to the decision making power they they have and need and, you know, give them back like environmental rights, labor rights and all of that will not work. So I think, again, it is really about this space for for those alternatives to work in a democratic way. I mean, I think that that's what we need to do, because otherwise you could have these imperatives of the, you know, the climate uh, change, the climate crisis, uh, the price of um, raw materials, of gas, of, um, you know, energy that will impose those changes upon us. And this can be done in a very um, authoritarian way. And I, I don't think that's the way we want to go to. And that's why we need to, to move fast and we need to show that those models uh, are working. And I think that's why we need communities and cities to be driving those transformations because, you know, you have to, um, yeah, to put at, at the center um, people, their participation, their fundamental rights, and then show that actually this is not increasing inequalities, but this is reducing inequalities of all kinds, geographical, gender, economic, social, um, ethnic, uh, um, diversity, and so on. So, so I think that's, that's a little bit like the big goal that we have. In our last 10 minutes or so, we've got, um, I want to take a couple questions that we're getting in from the audience. Um, a, a, a really interesting one, I think that this is a cool framing that kind of continues with what you were just saying about what if cities treated their citizens like customers they wanted to retain? So what if the mayor was the equivalent of the CEO running an organization, trying to keep his citizens, you know, trying to keep them as happy employees? How might that change how cities are, are operating? How might that change how city governments are operating? Who would be the the chief product officer or the chief financial officer or the you know head of human resources and all of those things um you know how might that change the way cities are operating if we thought about them more like a company where people had had the ability to to leave or change yeah do you want to think you you francesca what do you think <laughs> i'm sure what do you think <laughs> I think it's a I think it's a really interesting framing to think about the idea of the the responsibility that that city leaders have to their to their citizens and the idea of you know what what would make you want to stay in a city what makes you valuable because obviously you can't do all things at all times right um, but helping to identify like you said before that that autonomy of the citizen to feel like they're invested in their city or they feel like they're being heard or they feel like they're part of something bigger um, I think that's often when you when you stay with a company or when you stay with a, a product, it's because you feel an emotional tie to it or you feel like you're contributing to something that makes a big difference. And so I loved what you were saying before about cities as laboratories and thinking about citizens as people who are participating in this great experiment of how we become a more sustainable city or how we become a more a smarter city. And, and maybe sometimes those solutions work out and maybe sometimes they don't because it's a laboratory and we're, we're trying something together that makes for, for a better future. Yeah, no, and I think also possibly it's not the right model to think about the mayor as a CEO. I think actually, I think for me, I mean, maybe and I'm going to be a bit romantic here. I was just in Athens um, a few days ago and, you know, coming back where democracy was invented and the kind of institutional form that it took in order to make it work. I think now we are at the at the well, at a very historical point where in order to have this transformation to happen, just take the two, you no know, transition, the green and the digital transition in a sustainable and inclusive way, we really need new institutional forms. And I think when we're talking about the laboratory and experimentations in CIS, it's not just exactly a product or an app or a service, but it's a, a new institution. or create public administration, but also in the outside, learning to work in a systemic way, in an ecosystem with the, public, with the private sector as well, with the innovators, with the unions, with the political parties, with the, with the, um, with the citizens themselves. And I think that's what's very fascinating for me, this ecological, um, you know, this, this kind of digital sustainable ecosystem that cities can create. But I think then the mayor really, um, the figure there is, is much more linked to how democracy works. And it's complicated, you know, it's never, so it's not like a CEO, you take a decision. I mean, of course, you have a shareholder, but here is like this 
stakeholders model and the kind of public return and the environmental impact and the social impact that you need to create is more complex. And I think I value a lot that, you know, sometimes maybe decisions don't appear to be so fast, but at the end, they can be more wise and more sustainable over the long term. So we shouldn't just, um, you know, dismiss democracy as something, okay, too complicated to do. I think it's a process and it's uh, it's absolutely the best model we have and we should nourish it and we should show that yes sometimes it may seem a bit slower but actually you know the type of transformation that require a kind of new deal and a new constitutional framework and so on they require very good regulation and also this kind of interaction with everybody in the system and i think that that that's that's the real value of of also cities, and so I would, I would, um, yeah, I would use the kind of democratic uh, metaphor uh, much better. I think we probably have time for just one more question before we're Maybe out of time. The gender, the yes. gender issue, I think. Yes, I, I think so. Bringing it back. Huh? No, I was going to say bringing it back to how our, our conversation started about about this gender issue. We have one of our, our audience members asking yeah. about, you know, struck that here are two women talking about circular economy and sustainability, layering in a human city rather than a, a technology centered smart city. Um, do we feel like that 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 feminine touch to thinking about collaboration and sharing and an involvement and thinking systematically, the, the person's asking, does the 21st century require more mm -hmm. female traits? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, yes. I, I always, I, I started many of my speeches saying that the digital revolution can only be a feminist revolution. I would say the same thing uh, for the sustainable uh, revolution. And, and, I, and I think also this kind of gender equality and and all the kind of feminist uh, policies have to be transversal to everything we do and have to be very central because, I mean, still, especially actually in technology, we're talking about, you know, less than 20, I mean, 30% globally, but in some places, less than 20% uh, of uh, women that are participating at all level in academia, in industry, in society, we have a huge gender pay gap, we have lots of problems with women doing their career, combining a uh, life with work, uh, um, you know, I, I think uh, creating the good jobs of the future should be also women led they shouldn't just be uh you know um yeah uh so i think i think we need to put this kind of gender issue and uh turn the sustainable and green transition into feminist uh, revolution as well <laughs> so there I is a lot agree. to do there and and also sometimes it can really help to make policies that are specifically targeting for that for example now in the big investment scheme the next generation eu uh, in italy we are applying clauses in public procurement contracts and negotiation for the investment that have a percentage of employment of um, women and young people for example that can be a way and then having this kind of monitoring mechanisms where you see the gender impact of all the investments and new policies you do and in the fund that i run the innovation fund that i run i try to really channel the money um, the money to uh startups that are funded by women and also uh invest like funds that are run by women so also in the financial uh part that is really really low <laughs> so uh so i think we can do a lot of things but we have to do them systematically and then we have to have the right uh, policies in place. But I think it's a defining issue of our future, of course. I absolutely agree. Francesca, I think we're out of time. Thank you so much. This was a fantastic well, conversation. Thank you, Lauren. Nice thank also you. talking without the moderator. I think this is a great experience. Just <laughs> I agree. Thank you so much, Melissa and the DLD well, team you. for having thank us. You.